it is a joy and a pleasure to be with like-minded brethren. Um, from the time David asked me to come and speak till, till we got here, I look forward to this because um, un unlike some brethren, uh, we get pretty lonely up there in western Oklahoma. Ever since Jess moved away, uh, nobody spoke to me. Uh, we don't, we don't have, we don't have the uh, the sound congregations around us like uh, you, brethren. I, I know at least two sound congregations here: Fish Hatchery Road and and Spring. And you're you're very blessed to be close to each other and to be able to associate and have fellowship. And it's a joy for us to be here. Charlene and I always enjoy being with you, brethren and uh, all like-minded brethren. The term Alpha and Omega is found only four times in the New Testament. Well, in all of the uh, <laughs> uh, Bible. And it's in the book of Revelation. Four times in that one book. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, I am the Alpha, or I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, I am Alpha and and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. In both of these instances, it's Jesus talking. <clears throat> then from the first part of that book, we turn to the end of the book of Revelation. In Revelation, Chapter 21 and verse 6, the scripture says, He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Then in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 13, the final occurrence of that phrase, Alpha and Omega, which says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And I think that's uh, pretty self-explanatory as far as that goes. I am Alpha, the Alpha and the Omega, or Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Alpha and Omega. Those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And they, this expression, this figurative use of them, is borrowed from the Hebrew alphabet, uh, which uh, uh, the Hebrew equivalent is Aleph and Ta. So when Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, it covers a great deal. Brother Wallace said of the statement in Revelation 21, 6, where he said, and he said unto me, it is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Brother Wallace said, with the proclamation, it is done, the vision proper concerning the church and tribulation had ended, and the revelation had ended, and God and Christ are the Alpha and Omega because they are the beginning and the end in creation and salvation. God's eternal nature is very succinctly expressed in five short words in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 3. Moses is tending his father-in-law's sheep in the land of Midian, and in the distance he sees on a mountain a bush that is burning. 
And as he continues to watch that bush and observe it, it's not consumed. It's not burning up. It just burns and burns. And he approaches that bush because his curiosity has the best of him. And I would be curious too if I saw something burning and burning and burning and it was never consumed. And God spoke to him from that burning bush. And he told him to take off his shoes. The ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. And God told him, I'm going to send you to deliver my people from Egyptian bondage. Basically is what he said. And Moses asked God, he said, what shall I say when the children of Israel ask me what is God's name? And God said in Exodus 3.14, I am that I am. Keel and DeLitch tell us that the repetition of the same word, I am that I am, suggests the idea of uninterrupted continuance and boundless duration. I think that's a scholarly way of saying eternal. God is eternal. He had no beginning. He has no end. You and I ha cannot comprehend that fully in our minds, in our, in our finite minds, because we live in a world that is bound and circumscribed by time and space. And everything we do has to do with time. Something has a beginning. We, we began this lectureship, and this lectureship will end. We begin the day, and then the day ends. And the older you get, and the closer you get to my age, the faster those days go. And they end, and then another day begins. And we cannot comprehend that there is something that is from everlasting to everlasting, boundless, limitless duration. Limitless duration. When Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, he expressed the same nature of uninterrupted, continuing, and limitless duration that God expressed to Moses at that bush in Midian. And as Moses expressed in the 90th Psalm, when he wrote, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Now the word art is in italics. It's not in the original. It was placed in this translation by the translators who thought it would help to perhaps clarify the thought of what was being expressed. So leave it out and see what the thought is. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou God. I think that says it better than thou art God. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou God. And as Brother Gene pointed out, the whole duty of man is actually better expressed as the whole of man. The whole of man. From everlasting to everlasting, thou, God. 
And that is the claim that our Savior made in John 8, 24, when he said, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. He said, I said unto you, ye shall die in your sins, for except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, in John 8, 24, again, we have an italicized word which uh, let's leave out because it wasn't in the original in the first place. Instead of saying, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins, Jesus literally said, except ye believe that I am, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus is I am. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is deity. He partakes of the same nature of the, as the other members of the Godhead, the Father and the Holy Spirit. And all three are God. Jesus said, except ye believe that I am ye shall die in your sins. Jesus also, in speaking with the Jews, having a discussion, in fact, it may have been termed a, a battle with the Jews, in John chapter 8, he had said, except ye believe that I am, ye shall die in your sins. Then later on in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 58, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. There was a time when you and I were not. That was a time before we was. And that's what Jesus said of Abraham. Before Abraham was, that means existed, before you and I were or was, before we existed, Jesus said, I am. He's not bound by time. God isn't bound by time. He lives outside of time. He exists outside of time. You cannot, we cannot compare God with this world of time. And Jesus Christ, though he came as a man and lived in this world of time and died as a man in this world, he predated this world. He lived before this world. Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse 26, speaking to those Jews, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. And they said unto him, Well, you're not 50 years old. You've seen Abraham? That's when Jesus made this startling statement. He said, Before Abraham was, I am. Now look at verse 59. What, did, what was the result of his statement to those Jews? Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, passing through the midst of them, and so passed by. Why did they want to stone him? For the same reason that they wanted him crucified. They said he blasphemed because he claimed to be God. They knew what he was claiming to be when he said, Before Abraham was, I am, he was claiming to be God. And he was making a rightful claim. I am. Before Abraham was, I am. So he is the Alpha, the beginning, and the Omega, the end. 
He is the Alpha of creation, and he is the Omega of creation. He is the third person of the Godhead and is of an eternal nature and was there in the beginning. John wrote in John chapter 1 beginning in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And we are told then later, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's talking about Jesus Christ. Several years ago, I was driving down the highway listening to news on my radio. And something came on that really caught my ear. Some kind of scientific news about the uh, various heavenly bodies that <laughs> I wanted to say float around this space. They don't just float. They, they, have, <laughs> they have purpose there and they have direction. They're not just floating. But this news piece that I heard on my car radio said that scientists or astronomers have uh, figured out, they think, why that these heavenly bodies can all mix and mingle and float in space and not collide, not run into each other. What keeps them from running into each other? There's a lot of them up there. What keeps them from running into each other? And they, they said, this news story said, well, they have discovered what they, uh, the scientists call the galactic constant. There is a power, a galactic constant, that keeps those constantly at certain distance where they don't, the heavenly bodies don't collide. And when they said that, I immediately, at that moment, driving down the highway, thought of what the Hebrews writer said. After he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high and upholding all things by the word of his power. There is what they call a galactic constant. I call it the word of God. The word of God. The word of Jesus Christ. The Logos the third person of the Godhead, the one who was there in the beginning with God. He is the third person of the Godhead. He was there in the beginning with God. He was one of the us to whom God referred in Genesis 1.26 when he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let us. Elohim, God, plural, Elohim. There aren't three gods. There's only one God. There are three persons that constitute the Godhead. Jesus Christ, the Word, the Logos, is one of those. Jesus Christ is preeminent. He is the Alpha of creation. And the Apostle Paul recognize the preeminence of Jesus. He summed up his preeminence in Colossians 1, beginning verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, <clears throat> for by him were all things created <coughs> that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or thing or uh, all things were created for him and by him and he is before all things and by him all things consist and he is the head of the body the church the firstborn 
beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus is the firstborn of all, of every creature. What does that mean? I mean, he was, he was the first one born? He's a creation? No. He's not a creation of God. He is God. He is deity. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the great I Am. As the firstborn of every creature, he was the first one to be raised from the dead. Someone says, wait a minute. The widow of Nain's son was raised before Jesus. And Jesus raised Lazarus. Let me finish. He was the first one to be raised from the dead and ascend to heaven, never to die again. There is what makes him the firstborn of every creature. The widow of Nain's son died. Jesus brought him back, but he had to die again. Lazarus came back from the dead, but he had to die again. I appreciated what David had to say about Jesus and his power, of his word, uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. And David, when you were mentioning that, and that was an outstanding lesson, I thought of what Brother Keeble said. Someone asked Brother Keeble one time, I said, Brother Keeble, why, why did Jesus say, Lazarus, come forth? And Brother Keeble said, well, if he hadn't called Lazarus' name, every grave in that cemetery would have been open. <laughs> and that, was, that would have been true. But he called Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Lazarus had to die again. But Jesus Christ, when God declared him to be his son with power by the resurrection from the dead, as Paul notes in Romans 1, he never had to die again. He ascended back to the Father. He went to heaven from which he will return to judge the world at the last day. <clears throat> he is the firstborn. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is not only the alpha of physical creation he is the alpha of spiritual creation and that spiritual creation of God is of course the church not only is he the alpha of physical creation but he's also the omega of it first and last he is the beginning and the end. The beginning of physical creation, the end of physical creation. Listen to this. Paul describing the judgment coming in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that troubled you and to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire in vengeance, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. That's at the end of the world. That's the judgment day. That's what he's talking about. Christ is coming back. But that will be the end of the world when Jesus does come back. The world will cease to be. Now I know that uh, Jess's friend, Don King, and uh, others over there of that, um, I think you could call it, uh, it's not a lunatic fringe, it's a lunatic persuasion of this uh, so-called 70 A.D. thing that uh, the world ended in A.D. 70 and uh, it's just going on now. 
But the Bible teaches otherwise, and Peter teaches otherwise. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter said, <clears throat> they're going to come in the last days, skeptics or scoffers. There will come scoffers, walking after their own lusts. This is in, by the way, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. And in verse 4 he says, They'll be saying, Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. See, those people are uniformitarians. I'm glad I learned it. I don't remember where I learned it, but I sure like to use that word because it makes me sound intelligent. <laughs> they are uniformitarians. Those are people who think that what you see is the way it's always been. That ain't so. The world was changed long ago during that flood. What you see today is not the same thing that God created. It's, he created this earth, that's certainly so, but it's been changed. Today it rests 23 and a half degrees tilted on its axis. That gives us our seasons. I can hardly wait till this ice season's over in Oklahoma. But it gives us our seasons. The earth was changed. And he says, they say, though, where's the promise of his... Everything continues as they were from the beginning. A uniformitarian doesn't recognize there was a cataclysmic or a cat catastrophic occurrence that happened that changed the earth and it was forever changed. We didn't have storms, we didn't have viruses, we didn't have disease. Didn't have any of those things. Because God made it perfect. Now we have wind and storms and mountains and various things. But it says, uh, Peter goes ahead to say, they're willingly ignorant of this. It's not like they're just ignorant. They're willingly ignorant of this. That by the word of God, by the word of God, the heavens were of old. There's your galactic constant. There, by the word of God, all of this was brought forth. God commanded and it was done. He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. By the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing in the water and out of the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But now the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. But his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, that's the omega of creation, the day of the Lord will come as a thief, in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. There's the omega of creation. The alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. His second coming will signal the judgment and the end. Of material creation. When he returns in judgment. The heavens. And the earth. Of which he is alpha. Will pass away. The AD 70 bunch says. Well that elements means. Uh, Jews. Uh, elements means the Jewish law. Or the, the something to that effect. <laughs> you know sometimes. You. Uh, the Bible says answer a fool according to his folly. And then it says don't answer a fool according to his, according to his folly. And 
I, I think when, when you read that, you can just say, well, just don't answer them. <laughs> they can't read that and see it. They, there's no hope for them. The heavens shall melt with fervent heat. The earth, the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Not only is he the Alpha and the Omega of creation, he is the Alpha and Omega of our salvation. The, the Hebrews writer referred to Jesus as the Alpha and Omega of salvation when he called him the author and finisher of our faith. That's in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Same as saying, he is the Alpha and Omega. Christ was the creator of the universe for the Father. And then this is looking there at uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, this is according to Robertson's word pictures. He says, Christ was the creator of the universe for the Father. So now he is the consummation of redemption. He is the Alpha and Omega of redemption as well as physical creation. Salvation originated in God's eternal purpose before the world began. Ephesians 3.11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church was purposed in the mind of God before the world began. Salvation was purposed in the mind of God before the world began. And preeminent in that salvation is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Lamb of God, Peter says, was foreordained before the foundation of the world. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, Forasmuch as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a, as a lamb without blemish and spot, who verily was foreordained before the world began, but was manifested in these last times for you. Christ was foreordained. That lamb of God was slain before the world began. How can you say he was slain then when he wasn't slain till Calvary? Because in the mind of God it was done. You see, we do not, God does not live in time like we do. When God purposes a thing, it is done. When he told Joshua... I have given into thine hand Jericho. He used the past tense. It's done. I gave you Jericho. But they hadn't taken it yet. They had to march around it. Once a day for seven days. And on the seventh day they had to march around it seven times. They had to shout, blow the trumpets, and walk every man straight forward. Took a whole week, but a week before that God said, I have given it to you. He spoke of it as though it was done. Christ was foreordained. He was slain from the foundation of the world. When God told Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains in Moriah, which I will show thee, Abraham did it. And you know what? When God told him to do that in Abraham's mind, Isaac was dead because he purposed to do that. He purposed to do that. There was no question in the mind of Abraham. Salvation originated in the mind of God. In the Old Testament, Christ was preeminent and the promises 
If he, or rather, Genesis 3.15, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between her seed and thy seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Christ is in that passage. The scheme of redemption, as Brother Wallace said, is there in germ form. That's the germinal prophecy, or that's the seed of all Old Testament prophecy concerning the scheme of redemption, Jesus Christ and his scheme. When Isaiah said, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountain, shall be exalted among, above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. He was talking about the church. He was using highly figurative language in Isaiah the second chapter. He said, Many people go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He was prophesying of the church. Paul said in 1 Timothy, Chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, that the house of God is the church of the living God, and it is that church over which Christ is head. It is that house over which Christ is a son over his own house. Not only is he the alpha of our salvation, but he is the lawgiver of our salvation. He is the alpha and omega of all divine authority. When he comes in judgment, Acts 17, 30, and 31, the world will end. That will end our salvation. And then, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says he will deliver the kingdom up to the Father. Millennialists have him coming back to establish his kingdom. They have him uh, 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 being crowned king on, at his second coming. But his second coming doesn't signal the establishment of his kingdom and the coronation of Christ. It signals his abdication. He'll deliver up the kingdom to the Father. And my friends, brethren, he'll take us home. He'll take us home. That's what it's all about. You and me going home. Home. That's what's going to happen at the end of the world. We're going to go home. Never to die again. Following Jesus Christ, who is the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn of all creation, who now speaks with all authority from God. <clears throat> Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, but he hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. The same one of whom he told the apostles in Matthew 17 and verse 5, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The same one who said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, all, bab all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Alpha and the Omega, creation and our salvation. Whatever is done in teaching or practice that does not have Christ's authority is sin. Read it right there. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means by his authority. Giving thanks unto God and the Father by him. If your preaching and your practice is not in accordance with the word of God, it's a sin. If it's not authorized by Jesus Christ, it is sin. He is the beginning and the end of all authority and all salvation for men today. And beside him, there is no other. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is indeed the Alpha and the Omega.